so the Mannings suggested that he return the following evening alone. He did. What role Maria took at that time was un is unclear, but as Frederick Manning later told it, when O'Connor walked downstairs in the Manning home to wash his hands preparatory to eating dinner, uh, Maria placed a pistol behind his ear and shot him. As depicted here, O'Connor fell to the floor. Some of the kitchen flagstones had already been removed and a hole had been dug in that kitchen floor. Uh, Frederick Manning then came in and later said, he moaned and I never liked him very well and I battered in his skull with a ripping chisel. Frederick and Maria then hogtied O'Connor. They pushed his body into a hole. They uh, doused him with a pint and a half of vitriol, which was probably sulfuric acid in an attempt to uh, uh, perhaps dissolve his body or at least part of it. Uh, it was not enough to do that job. Then, I guess as double insurance, they encased him in quicklime. A word about lime in any of its forms, quick lime, slate, slate lime. Uh, Ill-informed murderers through the ages have believed that lime quickly dissolves flesh and bone. It doesn't. Mel uh, O'Connor being uh, murdered and, and, and lying under their floor uh, the next day, that day actually, and the next day, Maria went to his home, which was in the east end of London, and stole railway shares. In an apparent double cross, Maria and Frederick absconded in opposite direction from London. Maria had the stocks. O'Connor was missed almost immediately. The search took the police to the Manning home. They eventually, in about a week, found his body under the kitchen floor. And soon, Maria was apprehended in Edinburgh, Scotland, and Frederick Manning was apprehended on the Isle of Jersey. This murder took place in August 1849. The Mannings were convicted in October, and the execution was in November. During the court proceedings, the Mannings uh, more or less turned on each other, and Maria made quite a scene in the courtroom. When she was convicted, she started uh, yelling about the unfairness of British justice. And at that period of history, the uh, custom was to uh, strew various herbs in the courtroom to uh, sweeten it, was the term, because a lot of the people who were defendants in the courtroom were uh, less than well washed. Well, Maria swept those herbs onto the well of the courtroom. So she made uh, quite a demonstration and find it ironic that the chief herb apparently that she distributed onto the floor was rue. So that's how the Mannings ended up on the roof on November 13th, 1849, to be hanged or in the parlance of the time, turned off. The crowd to witness this hanging had begun assembling about three days earlier. And it was rare for married couples to be hanged together, so that was quite an attraction. The crowd has been variously estimated as between 30,000 people and 50,000 people. So think of it, 30,000 people, a little bit less than Fenway Park, 50,000 people, maybe a little less than Yankee Stadium. Some fashionable London men's clubs had rented rooms, had rented housetops. So many landovers erected uh, rickety makeshift stands that they were warned by the city that if anybody got killed, they were gonna be prosecuted for manslaughter. There were hundreds of police. People were singing a variant of the song, Oh Susanna, called Oh Mrs. Manning, Don't You Cry For Me. There were refreshments, of course, including Manning's biscuits and Maria Manning peppermints. There were firecrackers. There were pickpockets. 
there were fights. Uh, Melville and his friend Taylor arranged the day before to, and this is from Melville's journal, to sally out at seven o'clock to see the last end of the Mannings. Herman Melville gazed upon the multitude assembled the morning of the hanging and said, another quote, men and women fading, fainting. The mob was brutish. After the drop, the hanging of the Mannings, Herman Melville noted that they, quote, hung side by side, still unreconciled to each other. That was probably not true. They apparently, during their incarceration, made up at least to some extent. Their swaying figures, Herman Melville mused, made pointed, quote, change from the time they stood up to be married together. And uh, here he must have thought of his wife, uh, Lizzie, back home. Now, the scene, again, a quote from Melville, all in all, most wonderful, horrible, and unspeakable. There was another writer there on another roof. Charles Dickens witnessed this execution and wrote a letter the next day to the London Times. And this is from that letter. When the two miserable creatures were turned quivering in the air, there was no more emotion, no more pity, no more thought that two immortal souls had gone to judgment, no more restraint in any of the previous obscenities than if the name of Christ had never been heard. Dickens did not really object to capital punishment as such, but he thought that doing it in public coarsened those who watched it. He was writing David Copperfield at the time his novels were serialized. He was writing that book. And when he came to write the novel Bleak House, he based the French maid Mademoiselle Hortense on Maria Manning. Melville was not quite as actively or dramatically moved. When the hangings were over, Melville and the doctor immediately went to breakfast. And then they visited the London Zoo in Regent's Park. Quote from Melville, very pretty, fine giraffes. He did mention reading about the murder five days later on a, quote, dismal and drizzling day. And if you've read Moby Dick, when you hear that phrase, you might be taken back to page one of Moby Dick, which takes place in New Bedford, when uh, Ishmael talks about the damp, drizzly November in my soul. Now, Shaw having paid for Melville's trip to London, Melville bought a souvenir. He bought a broadside about the Mannings, either uh, this one or something like it. I think we have a picture of that. There it is. Um, this actually says at the bottom of it, broadside of the Manning execution that Melville gave to Lemuel Shaw. I'm not sure that's known for sure. Um, but in this uh, woodcut, which is actually a pretty detailed one for some of these broadsides, you can see Maria Manning making her way up the stairs there on the left side. Um, there were a huge number of various Manning broadsides printed. I have read the figure of two and a half million. That seems a little exaggerated. It almost seems impossible, but even if the number were 10% of that, it's pretty impressive. Broadsides were single sheets printed uh, on one side. Uh, they could be a satire. They could be a puzzle. Uh, more commonly, they were an account in verse usually of a tragedy, a fire perhaps, or a horrific accident. And there was a popular subgenre called the gallows type, which obviously featured hangings such as this one. I think we have another picture of one. That was a different one. You can see at the top, Life of the Mannings executed at Horsemonger Lane Jail. And this one ends, this is a poem you might be able to discern, and it ends with the moral, old and young, pray take a warning. Females lead a virtuous life. 
think upon that fatal morning, Frederick Manning and his wife. Now, broadsides were sold by street vendors offering a loud patter regarding their products. And they would further draw customers uh, to, to them with large boards garishly painted with scenes of murder and execution, scarlet, light blue, orange, and these drawings would be waterproofed with gum resin. And I always am reminded of this kind of artwork when I think of that. It's probably something along this line. Next slide, please. Um, they didn't have Led Zeppelin at that time, of course, but those are the kinds of colors and that kind of blackness that I always uh, picture when I think of these uh, patter boards as they were known back in 19th century London. Now, what attracted Herman Melville to buy the particular broadside that he did, um, we don't know. I'm not even really sure which one he did buy, but he did buy one for Leonard Shaw. Had Melville stayed in England long enough, he could have bought another kind of souvenir. Porcelain figures of the Mannings. Ten days after Melville watched the Mannings hang in London in November 1849, another sensational murder occurred, this one in Boston. The Parkman Webster murder case is the most notorious murder in Massachusetts history until the Borden murders in 1892. Uh, the victim in the, uh, not quite here yet, if we could go back to the previous one. The victim in the Parkman case, uh, not just the victim, but several aspects of the Parkman case shared several characteristics with the Mannings case. Uh, money was the motive. The victim was a rich guy with a prominent jaw noted for walking around the city in pursuit of money. The murder occurred more or less on the, def on the uh, defendant's premises. There was the issue of the difficulty of disposing of human remains, especially in the kitchen or laboratory. Uh, dentures were helpful in identifying the victim, and both cases ended in a public hanging. This case, Webster, the one that we'll move to now, featured an unlikely cast of characters. They were overwhelmingly affiliated with Harvard College. There was also a grisly aftermath and at trial issues that resulted in lasting precedential importance. This was probably the most noteworthy case in a very long string of them in the influential career of Herman Melville's father-in-law, next slide, Lemuel Shaw. Lemuel Shaw, picture to here, became pretty much as prominent a figure in this case, in this trial, as either the defendant or the victim. Lemuel Shaw, just a little background, he was born in the old parsonage on Church Street, which is across Route 49 from the 1717 Meeting House in West Barnstable, probably about eight miles or so from this building. His father, Oakes Shaw, was the pastor in that meeting house for 47 years. When Lemuel Shaw entered Harvard, it was more or less assumed that he would become another in a line of congregational ministers. He would become a congregational pastor, but he fell in among lawyers. He became a highly successful trial lawyer in Boston. During his formative lawyering days, which some, some of which occurred in, in New Hampshire, he became friends with a guy named Alan Melville. Shaw became engaged to Alan's sister, Nancy Rowe Melville. Before their wedding, Nancy died suddenly, 1813. Shaw was 32 years old. For the rest of his life, which included two happy marriages, he carried around in his wallet two letters from Nancy Rowe Melville. Alan Melville's son, Nancy Melville's nephew, 
was Herman Melville. A few years later, 1818, Lemuel Shaw married Elizabeth Knapp. She died four years later, 1822, giving birth to Elizabeth, always called Lizzie, leaving Lemuel Shaw a widower at the age of 41. Uh, Lemuel Shaw remarried a woman named Hope Savage of right here in Barnstable. And in 1827 and 20 years later in 1847, Lizzie, 25 years old, a picture of her. Next slide, please. There she is. Um, married the 28-year-old Herman Melville. So instead of Lemuel Shaw becoming Herman Melville's uncle, he became Herman Melville's father-in-law. The year before the wedding, Melville had affectionately dedicated his first book, which was a sort of fictionalized account of his adventures in the South Pacific. It was called Taipee, A Peep at Polynesian Life. And he dedicated the book affectionately, affectionately to Lemuel Shaw. This, this book was highly successful. And... Uh, sort of an adventure novel of a kind, and uh, Herman Melville became known as the man who lived among cannibals. The highest court in Massachusetts is the Supreme Judicial Court. Uh, back in 1830, when the Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court died suddenly, uh, the governor at the time, Levi Lincoln, asked Lemuel Shaw to replace him. Another picture of Lemuel Shaw. There we go. Now keep in mind, Lemuel Shaw was not on the Supreme Judicial Court at that time. He wasn't even a judge. He was a lawyer. And it's a, it was a stupendous honor for him to be asked to ascend to the highest uh, seat on the highest court in the Commonwealth. But he balked. And uh, so Lincoln sent Daniel Webster, no relation to the Webster who's about to come on our stage, to talk Shaw into it. Lemuel Shaw didn't want to do it. One of the reasons was he did not want cut and pay. Uh, he was making uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $20,000 a year at that time, which was a considerable amount of money. And the Chief Justice of the SJC made less than $3,500 a year. But he eventually agreed to take on the job in 1830, and he began a 30-year tenure in that position. Uh, he was probably the most influential state court judge of the 19th century anywhere, but his true accomplishment was maintaining a full head of hair brown. Dr. George Parkman was one of the wealthiest, most respected Boston Brahmins before that term was even coined, which was in 1860 by Oliver Wendell Holmes, who also briefly meet again. Uh, Dr. Parkman had donated the land for the new medical college at Harvard. He had endowed the Parkman Chair of Anatomy in that college. He trained as a doctor, but he turned to his family's considerable business interests. And he attended to that business by mostly collecting rents and debts, that kind of thing, by striding around Boston with an odd gait with his jaw sticking out, as depicted here. He had false teeth. Those characteristics sort of relate him at least a little bit to O'Connor in the previous case we talked about. Now, George Parkman, at various times during the 1840s, had lent money to his old friend, John White Webster, uh, totaling several times John White Webster's annual salary, which was about $1,200. A picture of uh, Dr. Webster. There it is. Uh, he, as I just indicated, was a doctor like, Par uh, like Parkman, but he uh, could not sustain a successful medical practice. He lectured at Harvard Medical College in chemistry. He lived in Cambridge with his wife and four daughters. He was reportedly an affable party host. He spent money, too much money, to increase his social status and to expansively provide for his family. And the result was that he 
and suffered chronic financial difficulties. By 1849, John White Webster had still not paid his debt to George Parkman. Webster approached uh, a gentleman named Robert Gould Shaw, who was the grandfather of the famous captain of the Massachusetts 54th uh, Black Regiment in the, in the Civil War. And he asked uh, uh, Robert Gould Shaw if he was interested in buying his, that is Webster's, valuable minerals, which he had in a cabinet. Well, there were two problems with that proposition. The first one was that Webster had already pledged those minerals to Parkman as collateral for some of his debt. And the second problem was that Robert Gould Shaw was Parkman's brother-in-law. It didn't take long for Parkman to learn about Webster's offer to Robert Gould Shaw. And Parkman, as a result, was royally perturbed. Parkman had, uh, for quite a while, badgered Webster about the repayment of the loan, including disrupting Webster's lectures at Harvard. And uh, now, late November 1849, Parkman starts turning up the heat. On Friday, 23rd of November 1849, 10 days after the Mannings were hanged, 59-year-old uh, George Parkman, at Webster's invitation, visited Webster in his office slash laboratory at Harvard Medical College, uh, which was at that time about where uh, Massachusetts General Hospital is now. And in fact, if you walk up to the uh, main door there at Mass General, and there's a brick wall there on your right, you'll see a couple of plaques. One of them is about this case. Parkman visits Webster at Harvard, Parkman did not return home. The following day, Robert Gould Shaw offered a reward for information regarding his whereabouts. Because of Parkman's legendary punctuality and his habit, obviously, of carrying money around the city of Boston, his family suspected the worst. The worst, I should say. Uh, the police started receiving letters uh, that George Parkman was seen late Friday afternoon, that George Parkman was buried in East Cambridge, that uh, George Parkman's body had been dismembered and its pieces thrown into the Charles River. Now, the police, during their investigation of missing Parkman, perfunctorily searched Webster's lab in his rooms. They found nothing. The janitor, of the Harvard uh, Medical College was Ephraim Littlefield, who for whatever reason was more persevering. The picture here of Littlefield. Actually, that's Harvard Medical College. There you go, Ephraim Littlefield. Uh, e. Littlefield lived with his, with his family in the basement of Harvard Medical College next to the lab. Littlefield was suspicious of Webster. Uh, Doors that had usually not been locked all of a sudden were being locked. Uh, water was running for a long time. There was an unusually intense fire in the lab furnace. Uh, plus, the usually frugal Webster, at least with people who he considered to be his social inferiors, uh, all, uh, all of a sudden broke and Webster gave Littlefield a Thanksgiving turkey. That might not be the actual turkey that was given to uh, Littlefield at that time, but it kind of was like that, maybe without the figs. Part of Webster's lab contained uh, what was known as a privy vault. And on Thanksgiving Day, taking a break from this turkey or a similar one, uh, Littlefield took a, tr not, not yet, Littlefield back, Littlefield took a uh, chisel and a crowbar to break through from below five courses of brick separating the cellar from the privy. Now, just to get to that wall, he had to descend into a virtual sewer. Uh, 
The air in that sewer was so foul that he had trouble keeping his lantern lit, and he had to crouch in a dank tunnel that was 60 feet long and four feet tall. That's a lot of trouble to go through for a hunch. Uh, but the next day, Friday after Thanksgiving, not yet Black Friday, at least in the sense that we're accustomed to it, having alerted the police and some of the medical faculty, uh, Littlefield finally broke through the wall. And he could see by the lantern, not yet, he could see by the lantern right in front of him, how lucky, human pelvis, parts of two legs, human, trussed up in a hanging contraption of lines and fish hooks. The police returned. In Webster's furnace, they found a few other bones. They found pieces of blackened china dentures. And in Webster's tea chest, they found a torso containing a lung, kidney, spleen, and jammed in there a thigh. And put it all together, next slide, that was the totality of what was recovered. Uh, sorry about the juxtaposition of this slide with the previous one. The police descended on Webster's Cambridge home, uh, scooped him up, took him to Harvard to see the body parts that they had recovered in order to gauge his, gauge his reaction and perhaps have him blurt out a confession. Uh, they charged him with murder. Uh, he did not confess, and throughout this whole ordeal, he verged from hysterics to near catatonia, did not confess. Now, Boston at this time, the late 40s, was changing. Uh, in the previous few years, say three to five years before this incident, uh, people were fleeing Ireland specifically the potato famine there, and those people began filling the city of Boston. And since they were the latest immigrants, they were blamed for most of the crime that occurred in the city. Uh, this spurred the bolstering of Boston's police force, including the creation of America's first detective department. But now, the defendant in this case and the victim in this case were members of Boston's upper crust. And not just Boston, but Harvard. Harvard was deeply shaken. If this mild guy Webster could kill somebody, anyone could. Trial was set for the following March in 1850. Uh, at this uh, period of history, the Supreme Judicial Court, which of course now uh, the highest court in the land as it was then, but now they hear appeals, they don't do trials. Then they presided over capital cases. They usually had three justices. Here they had four. And you might think, well, what about appeals? Well, when issues of law arose during a trial, the court would make a, quote, final and conclusive ruling right then during the trial. There was an appeal process, but appeal grounds were very narrow and technical. This trial began on March 19th, 1850 in the old courthouse behind the old city hall. Now, before we look at the Webster trial, let's jump back two weeks. Now, Lemuel Shaw, who you will have gathered by now was going to preside over the Webster case, had presided over another capital case called Commonwealth versus Daniel H. Pearson. Pearson was a severely mentally challenged man charged with murdering his wife and two children with a razor. And really, there are two points about this case, but the one that I really like talking about is the defense counsel. The defense counsel, Pearson's lawyer, was a flamboyant guy from Lowell named Benjamin F. Butler. I have a picture of him right here. That's him on the right. Now, you might think that you don't know Benjamin Butler, but if you are a fan of the old TV show Monty Python's Flying Circus, you do. Next slide, please. Uh, that is Benjamin Butler. Actually, those are two Benjamin Butlers here named Teddy and Nettie. Now, during the Civil War, uh, 
Butler was a general and he became known, uh, at least in the Confederacy, as Beast Butler. Next slide, please. He was the Union Army commander of occupied New Orleans. Now it developed that there were some citizens of New Orleans who did not appreciate being occupied, especially by the Union Army. Some women cursed, uh, spat on, perhaps through the contents of chamber pots on Union soldiers. And Butler wanted to put a stop to that behavior. And he ordered that any woman who insulted a Union soldier uh, must be treated, quote, as a woman of the town, applying her avocation. Probably don't need any explanation as to what was meant by that. This was a gross affront to Southern womanhood. It really solidified hatred in New Orleans and the Confederacy general for Benjamin Butler, thus his nickname, Beast. Uh, he was also known in the Confederacy again as Spoons Butler because there were rumors that he stole several silverware from some of New Orleans' uh, grand houses. For years, many households in the South kept a portrait of Benjamin Butler. Next slide, please. That is a chamber pot. Now, despite or because of Southern enmity, Benjamin Butler became the governor of Massachusetts sometime after the Civil War in 1883. And coincidentally, he was succeeded the following year by George Robinson of Chicopee, Massachusetts, who, in, who would in 1893 become Lizzie Borden's chief trial counsel. But before all that, Benjamin Butler was a lawyer. And in this trial, the Pearson case, he defended Pearson on the ground that Pearson suffered from, pardon this term, but term current at the time, imbecility. And that that mental condition was aggravated by his wife's unfaithfulness and her refusal to grant Pearson conjugal rights. Pretty close to an insanity defense here in 1850. But on the 2nd of March, 1850, the jury convicted Pearson. But they did, go back please. Back, there, thank you. But uh, they did accept Benjamin Butler's defense to some extent. The jury foreman volunteered to presiding Justice Lemuel Shaw quote, that owing to the low state of the prisoner's capacity, they, that is the jury, unanimously recommend him to mercy. Now, Judge Shaw uh, then addressed Pearson for about a half an hour and then sentenced him to death. He was uh, hanged in Worcester in July, 1850. Shaw's rejection of the jury's unanimous recommendation for mercy was widely considered grossly harsh, and it didn't bode well for the next capital trial on which Shaw sat. So now we go back to the Webster case. 61 white guys in the jury pool, got a jury of 12 men in about an hour and a half, men. The first woman juror sat on a jury in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts exactly 101 years later in 1951. Uh, there were no alternate jurors. They just had the 12 men. Uh, even now, a district court jury uh, trial requires seven sitting jurors, even though six of those jurors deliberate because you never know what's gonna happen to somebody during the course of a trial or deliberations. Back then, didn't bother. We've got 12 people, that's it. The trial lasted 11 straight days, except for Sunday. They went from nine o'clock in the morning until seven o'clock at night with an hour and a half for lunch. There were journalists from all over, London, Paris, Berlin, 
spectators were admitted to the trial by ticket, uh, most of which cost uh, $5. Uh, that's a lot of money. Let's call it a, let's call it roughly, roughly $166.09 now. It's a lot to sit in a courtroom for 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, presumably, too, that money went into the state treasury. That seems kind of questionable. Every 10 to 15 minutes, the gallery, which was the upper public seats, were cle was cleared and a fresh pack of trial groupies admitted which resulted in the fact that some 60,000 people saw part of this trial. Webster sat in a dock surrounded by an iron railing, sort of a, uh, a symbolic cage in which the defendants at that time sat. Presumption of innocence, compromised a little bit, I think, by that custom. And facing him, right in front of him, were the judges, Lemuel Shaw in the center, or at least as much in the center as you can be when you have four people. A modern historian described uh, Shaw this way at that trial, quote, an alarming mountainous presence. He sat like a great warty toad at the center of the bench, embodying in his bulk the very weight of justice. I think toad is a little much, and that's why I brought this representation, uh, which isn't really fair. We probably should take that off. Um, that's that's Lemuel Shaw. Well, it's a bust of Lemuel Shaw, but toad, I think that's carrying it a little far. Uh, this, by the way, or that, was not the bust from Barnstable Superior Court, in, in which he's uh, uh, buffed up even a little bit more. Thanks to Sturgis Library for the loan of Lemuel Shaw's bust there. Trial, Commonwealth put up 64 or about 64 witnesses all told. Uh, the Commonwealth's theory was that Webster had uh, deliberately lured Parkman to his lab to murder him in order to erase his debts. One category of witness was especially important in this trial and in the history of criminal trials generally. One of the first criminal trials was Webster in which forensic medical evidence, dental in this case, was introduced. The Commonwealth had to prove that a homicide had occurred. They had to prove that Parkman was murdered. They had to prove that the body parts that were found added up to be George Parkman and they had to prove that Webster had committed that murder. Well, they had a little bit of a problem, the state of science being what it was at that time. No witness really identified those body parts as being those of George Parkman, with the exception of Parkman's dentures. These, you might recall, were plucked from the ashes of Webster's furnace. They were a critical piece of evidence for the Commonwealth. I have a picture of that exhibit. This was a uh, pl uh, plaster and wax mold with the jaw and teeth. Uh, Parkman's dentist was a gentleman named Dr. Nathan Keep. He uh, testified regarding the odd shape of Parkman's jutting jaw. Next slide, please. Uh, which you can even see here in this uh, skeletal reconstruction drawing. He's even walking there. The pedestrian is walking and he's got his jaw kind of uh, sticking out a little bit. So Dr. Keep testified about that uh, aspect of Parkman's physiognomy and he testified about the extensive work he had done on Parkman's dentures. Uh, unequivocally he testified these are the dentures he made for George Parkman. As usual, there was conflicting expert testimony. Uh, the question was raised whether a dentist, a dentist who created work could reasonably have identified it uh, or whether there was anything unique about it, especially given its time in a blazing furnace. The Commonwealth star lay witness, of course, was Ephraim Littlefield. Uh, Littlefield went on and on about his suspicions regarding Webster and about his finding the body parts in the privy. Uh, 
Webster's counsel did not attack Littlefield vigorously when he, that he and they probably could have on a couple of points. Littlefield was probably not an actual body snatcher, uh, but he did uh, facilitate Harvard Medical College's obtaining of corpses for dissection. Uh, though, as far as Harvard Medical College was concerned, this is probably a topic, the less said, the less discussed, the better. Uh, but even beyond that, Littlefield did rough preparation of corpses for dissection, so he knew how to take a human body apart. Also, there was the reward uh, for the uh, information regarding George Parkman that his family had put up. And those reward monies uh, totaled two or three times what Dr. Webster was making in a year, uh, never mind what Littlefield was making. So could defense counsel have scored some points uh, with some vigorous cross-examination of Little P Littlefield, maybe even created reasonable doubt? It didn't happen. When the defense case started on day eight, many witnesses, including the president, president of Harvard and other Harvardites, I understand that's the term, although I think Harvardians could be even better, uh, testified about Webster's reputation for peaceableness. And more than half a dozen witnesses testified that they saw George Parkman late Friday afternoon after he had supposedly been murdered. At this period of time, defendants could not testify on their own behalf. There was a uh, concern about self-incrimination. But they could, without being cross-examined, give a statement explaining the evidence that had been propounded against them. This is a good time for a defendant to proclaim innocence. Next slide, please. Webster did not do that. Now, you might remember uh, what Webster looked like from a previous slide, kind of a uh, doughy-looking, gentle, affable guy. As the trial progressed, he got a little sh more sharpish appearing, vampirish, one might say. Webster did stand up, though, and he quibbled uh, regarding minor points in the evidence against him. He suggested that there was evidence favorable to his position, but his lawyers hadn't used it, uh, even though he would provided them almost a 200-page set of instructions advising them, his lawyers, how to conduct his defense. Some of those notes suggested the possible involvement of B from Littlefield. But by the time Webster finished, it was late in the day. Regardless of that, Lemuel Shaw began a three hour long instructing of the jury. At first he seemed distressed, but as he went on, he reportedly became more authoritative, apparently mindful of the deep importance of this trial. What uh, Lemuel Shaw actually said to the jury on that evening is of course hazy, we don't know. There was a uh, publication of the instructions, but they were rewritten almost starting almost immediately after the trial. The instructions that Shaw gave to the jury, of course, describe the elements of the crime of murder, but there's, there are two aspects of them I point to uh, that uh, have sort of run down the ages, if you will, concerning circumstantial evidence and reasonable doubt. Uh, these, these critical doctrines have come down to us some 170 years later, uh, although they have been partially altered in the last couple of years, few years, five years, let's say. Shaw went on to the jury at length about circumstantial evidence. Uh, he pointed out that crimes are often committed in darkness, in secret locations, in secrecy generally, so there's often no direct evidence of, say, a crime like murder. Uh, circumstantial evidence must therefore suffice. Indeed, that kind of evidence, he posited to the jury, uh, is often more compelling than eyewitness testimony. And in that, he was probably right, as studies have shown more recently than Shaw's era, and eyewitness testimony can be very unreliable. 
Um, he said that circumstantial evidence uh, required the jury to draw inferences based on their experience from facts that had been proved to them. The chain of circumstances must lead to, he said, probably, a reasonable and moral certainty that the accused and no one else committed the offense charged. Uh, only very recently, as I said, the last five years or so, our Supreme Judicial Court uh, has created a new uniform jury instruction further explaining that phrase, moral certainty. So I'll point out to the jury that a probability that this defendant committed this crime, even a strong probability, is not enough. From circumstantial evidence, the jury could find guilt beyond reasonable doubt. And it was with this concept of reasonable doubt that uh, Shaw's instructions bred controversy, but ultimately uh, deep and lasting influence. The law in 1850 required the Commonwealth to prove that a crime had been committed by direct evidence to an absolute certainty. That seems an incredibly high, if not impossible, standard of proof. Uh, then, using that standard to prove that a crime had been committed, the Commonwealth was required, requ required to prove that the defendant had committed that crime beyond a reasonable doubt. Here, Shaw shook up things considerably, and he instructed that reasonable doubt applied to the whole case and could be proven by circumstantial evidence, just as now. In other words, that the crime had been committed, every element must be proven by, uh, re beyond a reasonable doubt and not by absolute certainty. Uh, Shaw was widely criticized that these instructions favored the Commonwealth and all but directed a verdict against Webster. Um, papers editorialized that the entire justice system of Massachusetts had been overawed, overawed rather, by the uh, great wealth of the Parkman family. Shaw received many letters of abuse. Some of them were vividly, directly threatening. After these instructions, uh, the jury went out and they reached their verdict in about two hours, about 10 o'clock at night. Now, apparently, it later came out, much of their two hours in deliberation was spent in silent prayer. The word spread that the court would reconvene with the verdict at quarter to 11. And people rushed to the courthouse uh, from all over to get as close to it as they can to hear the verdict against or for Webster. Webster was guilty. On April Fool's Day, 1850, Webster was returned to the courtroom. Uh, Shaw again went on for quite a while, summarizing the crime, summarizing the trial, and noting his own pain in having to pronounce the sentence that the Attorney General had suggested was the only sentence available. This being the 19th century, Shaw got uh, religious, as apparently the jury had during its deliberations, and suggested to Webster that he might want to confess, uh, at least to God. And he ended by sentencing John White Webster to hang. Webster sought a pardon from Governor George Briggs on the ground that he was innocent, denied. Uh, then in July, a purported confession that Webster gave to a clergyman got to the governor. And it has never been determined if this purported confession was authentic. But what was set out in that, con that confession seems likely and set out what many believe then, many believe now, might well have happened if they didn't believe that Ephraim Littlefield was the killer. The confession admitted the killing, but uh, it argued that Webster's killing of Parkman was not premeditated. Parkman had come to Webster's uh, lab, his rooms, had aggressively taunted Webster, and had 
threatened that he would have Webster fired from Harvard. Webster was overcome by passionate anger. He grabbed a piece of grapevine, which was a piece of kindling wood, and he hit Parkman in the head, killing him instantly. Next slide, please. Just as depicted here. He immediately tried to revive Parkman. And that was unsuccessful. Now, the guilt of this kind of homicide, and actually Shaw referred to it in his lengthy instructions to the jury, and he referred to it as heat of blood. If this had been argued during the trial, the scenario, it might well have ended with Webster not receiving the death sentence. But even with this information, the governor believed that Webster's murder of Parkland had been premeditated. He would not interfere with the sentence. Um, again, whether that confession was authentic or not, never became known. But once it did become known, the criticism of Shaw's handling of the trial all but evaporated. On August 30th, 1850, uh, John White Webster, 57 years old, was hanged outside Leverett Street Jail. He was reportedly calm and resigned. Uh, Pearson, Daniel Pearson, had been judicial execution in the Commonwealth number 249. John White Webster was number 250. Thousands of people gathered, fewer than the Mannings. Herman Melville was not in attendance. Uh, he was in the Berkshires, staying at the old Melville family mansion and farm, uh, which had just been sold outside the family. Uh, that house is now the country club of Pittsfield, which is on uh, Route 7 when you're coming into Pittsfield from the south. Uh, Melville was out there cultivating his friendship with Nathaniel Hawthorne, uh, but he also did meet out there Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was the dean of Harvard Medical College, the scene of this whole saga. Uh, two weeks after Webster's hanging, Chief Justice Shaw lent uh, $3,000 to Herman Melville so that he could buy the farm that he named Arrowhead, which is on Holmes Road in South Pittsfield, and you can visit that today. Uh, Dickens was not there either. Uh, but on his second trip to Boston in 1867, one of the first things he wanted to see was the room where Webster murdered Parkman. Now, the Leverett Street Jail closed the year after Webster was hanged there, and it was replaced by the nearby Charles Street Jail, which is now the Liberty Hotel owned by and adjacent to Mass General Hospital, the site of the murder. Webster, even at late days of his life, was still striving to be accepted in Boston and Cambridge society. He had deeply wished to be buried in the prestigious Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge. And the day he was hanged, a crowd waited there for his body to arrive, which it didn't. Uh, Shaw is buried there, and plenty of other luminaries are, but Webster was denied burial in Mount Auburn. Apparently what happened to Webster was three guys snuck up to Copps Hill Cemetery with Webster in a plain coffin on a wagon, and they surreptitiously dug a hole and buried him off a pathway where Webster was buried, if indeed he was buried at Copps, Copps Hill, is unknown. There was a fund created for the benefit of Webster's wife and his daughters. And the first person to contribute to that fund was George Parkman's widow. 10 years to the day of Webster's hanging on August 30th, 1860, Judge Justice Lemuel Shaw retired. The following March, uh, 1861, he was 81 years old by that time, 
He rode aimlessly in a carriage throughout Boston uh, till about midnight. He apparently was suffering from a stroke. He died shortly after arriving home. And his last words were reportedly, gentlemen of the jury. And that is it. Thank you. We do have one more slide just to show you. Uh, I think there's one more. There it is. That is uh, the Shaw family's plot in Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge. Thank you. Uh, yes, if people have any questions that they have somehow communicated to us here in this building, we will do our best to try to answer. If one of your questions is about the delay, I'm technically unable to answer that. Um, this is Blue Magruder. Um, Blue Magruder, I, thank you. Well, you're welcome, but I'll tell you a little why I thought this would be fun. And that is I spent 12 years working at the Harvard Museum of Natural History. And I don't know if you know why Webster borrowed the money, but it's a better story if you tell it. And that is in 1842, there was an almost complete mastodon uncovered in New Jersey. And Webster borrowed $3,000 to buy that mastodon for Harvard. And the mastodon is on display. And there, there's a beautiful old plaque from when it went on display. And both oh. Parkman and Webster are credited as donors for buying that mastodon. So he uh, was Apparently that was an entree into Boston society, would, would be well, a, he, IA, an yes, extinct and mammal. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't borrowing the money just for a profligate life. He was buying it to get this priceless mastodon into Harvard's collection. And you're absolutely right about putting up his mineral collection. And I think Harvard still has some of his minerals, which was for- I believe fabulous. that's true. That, that, yeah. I, that I have heard. In the mineral museum. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, the the uh, comment was, I don't, uh, I'm, it suggested that I might need, I could not hear it very well, uh, but uh, one of the sponsors of tonight's program, Blue Magruder, uh, points out that uh, part of the money that Webster borrowed uh, in the 1840s, I think, uh, was to buy a mastodon skeleton, which is still on display in the, is it in the Harvard Museum of Comparative Harvard Zoology? Museum of Natural History. Harvard Museum of Natural History. Oh, Harvard Museum of Natural History. Okay. Yeah. Which uh, I've been in the other museum and I didn't see the well, mastodon. It used to be called the Museum of Comparative Zoology. But oh, okay. The public part of the MCZ is the Harvard Museum of Natural History. Okay. Yeah, right. which is well, where glass flowers are and all that. Well, once the uh, coronavirus is over, we'll have to organize a field trip on a bus and go up and see uh, Webster's Mastodon, yeah. which is and not a bad name for a rock group, by the way. Yeah. And the other thing, it is told at Harvard that Parkman was just horrible at hounding Webster for the money all the time. So okay. anger could have been a legitimate thing. But uh, anyway. <laughs> Well, yeah, that, and yeah. The, the, uh, Blue Magruder has pointed out that uh, it's well known still around Harvard, I guess, that Parkman was pretty merciless in hounding Webster for the repayment. For paying of these, back uh, the money. These monies. Uh, he he, he uh, lent Webster money over, you know, more than once. Okay. And it added up to be quite a, quite a sum. But uh, yeah, he was, uh, he was not nice about it. He apparently even stood in the back of Webster's classroom and would, would, would make comments during yeah. the Webster's yeah. lectures. And so. do you know that Parkman had the house that, the, that is right next to the State Department? It's on Beacon Street, right next to the State Department. That was Parkman's house. To, to the State House. To the State House, yeah, that's yeah. right. Okay. Yeah, right. Uh, point is made that uh, uh, Parkman's house was right next to uh, the State House on Beacon Street. Yeah. And Shaw lived on Mount Vernon Street in Beacon Hill. Yeah, that's neat. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for those points. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thank you. As a former lawyer and former judge, okay. did you, do you see significant flaws in the defense of Webster? You alluded to that in your comments. How significant were those opportunities that were missed 
in his defense. Well, that's something you never know. You never know what the jury fixes on. But in my mind, they should have gone after uh, Littlefield, uh, you know, along the lines of the points that I raised. You mean to tell me that you got up from Thanksgiving dinner and crawled into a 60 foot long sewer with a chisel and a crowbar and went through five courses of brick on a hunch? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things, a lot of hay could be made, I think, in cross-examining uh, Littlefield. And uh, Webster wasn't very satisfied with the job that his lawyers had done in that point. That was certainly part of the very lengthy memo that he had provided them about how to do this. So he was disappointed. Uh, great. Yes, another question. Another question. Do you know when Massachusetts stopped paying people for capital crime or when we banned capital punishment? Uh, the question is, when did Massachusetts stop hanging people for, uh, and when did they, when did Massachusetts end capital punishment? Was yeah. that? The, uh, well, hanging went out of fashion in most places when the electric chair came in. So uh, the electric chair was used in Massachusetts, uh, most notably in Charlestown prison in 1927 when Sacco and Vanzetti were executed there. So right, uh, probably a decade or so before that, the electric chair came in. The last people to be executed in Massachusetts, and their names just went right out of my head, uh, two guys who had killed a, uh, I think the victim was 19 years old. Uh, they were electrocuted, and that was in 1947. So capital punishment effectively ended in Massachusetts in 1947, but it was probably, I'm going to say, in the 1960s when it was more formally ended here. Anything else? That's it. Again, thank you all for tuning in. If you're still hanging on there, thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. I have heard the presentation you did five years ago. So